Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Today we are going to have a CK talk about the story of Koxingya and then and pop another name, uh, Chinese name is Zheng Cheng Gong. Uh, then uh, that's for today. And the next week, uh, Ma, uh, February 23rd, and I'm going back to talk about Feng Yolan's history, a short history of Chinese philosophy. Uh, chapter two, and which is about the background of the uh, Chinese philosophy, and then uh, then we finish uh, February project. Then uh, March, uh, I think our schedule is Bhagavad Gita, and uh, and I will bring a special section about the method of Zen Buddhism, and March sixteen, I will continue on the. Uh, history of and a short history of the Chinese philosophy and doing on the uh, chapter three. Okay, so uh, it will continue. Uh, so uh, we have a special section today for CK. That's his second time to do the presentation. And then I think CK is interested in the great hero in the histories. That's why, you know, mm -hmm. choose this one. I'm not sure, you know, CK, that's your turn, please. <laughs> well, uh, Jason, thank you for the introduction. Uh, today, my presentation is on the Lord of the Imperial Surname. And before um, I go any further, I have a lot of ground to cover. So I uh, entreat all of you to uh, keep your questions uh, in mind and take note of the questions. If you do not have the chance to ask it because there, there will be areas in the segments where there, there will be a chance to ask one or two questions or comments. But if you, don't, if you don't get to ask those questions, keep them in your mind or take them down and you can ask them uh, at the end of the session. I hope to get through this presentation. There's a lot of ground to cover. Uh, that's all there is, you know. And uh, after that, uh, we can uh, have a uh, discussion on, on this uh, great man of history. Uh, in this presentation, I use I will be using the name Zheng Chenggong and Kosinga interchangeably because they mean the same person. Kosinga is the name that uh, has gone down in history uh, in the for the Western audience, but for the Chinese audience, it's uh, he's known as Zheng Chenggong. So that's just to clarify. Okay, so I'll just uh, start. I'll start with the life of uh, Zheng Chenggong. So he was born on uh, 27th August uh, as Zheng Sen. He was born in Hirado in Nagasaki, in Nagasaki, Hizen province in Japan, to uh, father Zheng Zhilong, a Hokkien Chinese merchant. Uh, some call him a pirate or an entrepreneur in today's words. And a Japanese woman known as Tagawa Matsu. Uh, he also had the name of Tamu, meaning great wood, given by his uh, teacher Qian Qian Yi. Uh, when he studied in Nanjing later on in life. So from 1624 to 1631, he was raised in Hirado until the age of seven, uh, and he was given the Japanese name Fukumatsu. And after that, he moved back to uh, the Fujian province of the Ming Dynasty, China. His boyhood in Japan laid the foundation for his dramatic life by inculcating the virtues that defined them, righteousness and a warrior's loyalty to his lord. In those days, Japanese boys of samurai background as young as two or three wore swords, and their training began early with lessons in martial arts and letters. These uh, were the two pillars of uh, samurai education. So on Hirado Island, Kosinga or Zheng Chenggong studied swordsmanship with a teacher named Master Hanabusa. So this is the uh, map of uh, Nagasaki. They're showing where uh, Hizen is in Japan. So you can see this is the area. And then this is uh, Hirado in uh, Japan, in the Nagasaki area. And his um, father's uh, ancestral land of origin uh, is Nan'an Chenzhou Prefecture in Fujian Province. So if you look, this is Fujian Province, and this is Chenzhou. I don't know if you can see this last slide. Um, within the vicinity of Chenzhou is the uh, is the uh, 
you know, precinct of Nan An or what the Hokkien would call Nam Wa. So that's where uh, Zheng Chenggong's family came from. So that's a very dashing uh, portrait statue of uh, Zheng Chenggong. So at the age of uh, 14, 1638, he became a Xiu Cai, meaning a successful candidate uh, in the imperial examination. In 1641, he married the niece of uh, one of the officials uh, from uh, Huian, Huian Prefecture. So in 1644, Zheng Sun, at the age of 20, studied at the Guo Zijian, meaning the Imperial University in Nanjing, where he met the renowned Confucian scholar Qian Qian Yi and became Qian Qian Yi's student. In 1644, uh, following the fall of the Ming Dynasty uh, to the rebels, follow, following the fall of Beijing to Li Zicheng, the uh, Chongzhen Emperor, Emperor committed suicide. And uh, Wu Sangui's forces uh, gave the Manchus entry to Beijing by letting them in uh, Shanghai Pass. So this is a map of the Battle of Shanghai Pass in 1644 where the Manchus were the ones in, uh, in red, they entered through the uh, Shanghai Pass, uh, past the Great Wall of China, and took Beijing in 1644. So this is the uh, famous Shanghai Guan, Shanghai Pass, outside of Beijing today. It's called uh, Tianxia Di Guan, meaning the, uh, the number one pass under the heaven. Very important strategic pass. So the Ming, the Rump Ming uh, remnant forces retreated to Nanjing where they put, uh, put this uh, Prince Fu or Fu Wang on the throne as the Hongguang Emperor in an attempt to continue this uh, Ming dynasty in the south. So uh, in uh, consequence, the Manchu armies advanced south and conquered Yangzhou and Nanjing while the Ming leader defending Yangzhou, Shi Kefa, was killed. And the Hongguang Emperor was later captured and executed. Uh, well, the Hongguang Emperor was actually a good for nothing. So, you know, in that sense, uh, it was uh, uh, not a surprise that it didn't last very long. In 1645, the Prince of Tang was in installed on the throne of the Southern Ming as the Longwu Emperor, with support from uh, Zheng Zhilong and his family. Uh, the Longwu Emperor established his court in Fuzhou, Fujian province. Um, and the court was controlled really by the Zheng family. And later on that year, there was another prince who proclaimed himself regent. All this is to mean that the, the Southern Ming, uh, they were not united. There were lots of factions and factional infighting, uh, jostling for power. It was in an unfortunate time when the Manchus were moving uh, south rapidly, but even the Ming, the remnants of the Ming couldn't control themselves. Instead of uh, uniting to face the Manchus, they were squabbling amongst themselves. So this is the map of the uh, showing the territory held by the uh, Southern Ming about 1644. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, you could see uh, that the uh, Southern Ming holds half the country in 1644. And then there's this uh, Da Shun, which is held by the Li, Li Zicheng uh, forces. And then Xi is a, another area held by another uh, leader called Zhang Xianzhong. So it was a, a time where, uh, in Chinese, it's called Tian Xia Da Luan, where the, uh, they were, there, were these, there was this uh, struggle to to uh, unite China by all these different factions. And here you have the portraits of the Emperor Hongguang and Emperor Longwu. This Emperor Longwu was a more capable emperor, but he had the misfortune of being uh, under the thumb of uh, Zheng Zhilong, which means that uh, he didn't have the independent power. So that was a little unfortunate. In 1645, the Longwu Emperor granted Zheng Zhilong's son, Zheng Sen, a new given name, Cheng Gong, meaning success, and the title of Guo Xingye, which in the West is known as Kosinga, um, Lord of the Imperial Surname. So from then on, Zheng Sen was known as Zhu Cheng Gong because he had the Imperial Surname of Zhu. 
uh, being the surname of the Ming Dynasty and the Empress. However, he would uh, be mistakenly known in history as Zheng Chenggong. So uh, really, he should be called Zhu Chenggong. But if you said Zhu Chenggong today, nobody will know who he is. So that's uh, you know an unfortunate, maybe not so unfortunate uh, hiccup in history that he's known as Zheng Chenggong, not Zhu Chenggong. Well, it is what it is. So in 1646, Kosinga led the Ming uh, loyalists to resist the Manchu invaders and won the favor of the Longwu Emperor. So this is an important uh, time because the Longwu Emperor gave Zheng Chenggong this title, Da Ming Zhao Tao Da Jiangjun, meaning the great Ming commander in chief of the punitive expedition. Uh, actually, it, literally, it means the, uh, the great general entrusted with the power to accept surrender and, and to punish. So it is the equivalent to the Sei Yi Tai Shogun, which means the commander-in-chief commander of the expeditionary force against the barbarians that the Tokugawa shoguns had from the uh, Tenno, from the Emperor of Japan. So if you want to make a comparison, Zheng Chenggong was the shogun of China, bestowed by the Ming Emperor Longwu. So he had the same title as the shogun of Japan. Is is instead that he's the shogun of China. If we can just think in those terms, he's called the uh, Da Ming Zhao Tao Da Jiangjun. So in 1646, September, the, Ming, the Qing armies, the Manchu armies, broke through the uh, Xianxia mountain pass in Fujian and entered Fujian province. Zheng Zhilong retreated to his uh, coastal fortress of Anping, which is today's Anhai, in Nan'an, Quanzhou, and the Longwu emperor faced the Qing armies alone. He, the emperor's forces were inadequate. They were destroyed. The emperor was captured and executed in October 1646. So this is a, a photo of the Xianxia Guan today in uh, Fujian province. And to the right, a dashing photo of Kosinga, Zheng Chenggong in Hirado. And then the Qing forces sent envoys to meet Zheng Chenggong secretly and, uh, sorry, Zheng Zhilong secretly and offered to appoint him as the viceroy of both Fujian and Guangdong provinces if he would surrender to the Qing. Zheng Zhilong agreed because he was an entrepreneur, a privateer, and he was uh, looking out for his own family's interests. And against the objections of uh, his family, especially Zheng Chenggong, he surrendered himself to the Qing forces in Fuzhou on 21st November 1646. Um, yeah. However, at the meeting to officially surrender, Zheng Zhilong was captured by the Manchus and dispatched to Beijing where he lived under house arrest from 1646 to 1662. It's important here to say that about 30 of Zheng Zhilong's loyal black guards fought ferociously to prevent his capture, and they died to the last man, showing Zheng Zhilong the tra treacherous traitor, what loyalty meant. So even the Africans and the Indians had more loyalty than Zheng Zhilong. So Kosinga and his uncles were left as successors to the leadership of Zheng Zilong's military forces. And Kosinga op operated outside Xiamen, recruited many men to join his cause in a few months. He used the superiority of his naval forces to launch amphibious raids on Manchu occupied territory in Fujian. And he managed to take Hong'an in Quanzhou Prefecture in early 1647. So he was already uh, proving a nuisance, more than a nuisance to the Manchus by then. And following the fall of Tong'an to the Zheng, the Manchus launched a counterattack in 1647. And then they stormed the Zheng family's hometown of Anping. This is a sad event because Kosinga's mother, uh, Miss Tagawa, had come from Japan in 1645 to join uh, Zheng Chenggong in Fujian, while his uh, younger brother remained in Japan. She did not follow her husband to surrender to the Qing dynasty. She was caught by the Manchu forces in Anping. She was violated after trying to distract other female members of the Zheng household from Manchu predations. And then later to protect her in shame, she committed suicide. 
So this is where uh, Hong An is today. This uh, area where you have the uh, in, on the map. And by 1650, Kosinga was strong enough to establish himself as the head of the Cheng family. And then he pledged allegiance to the Yongli Emperor, another uh, claimant to the Ming throne, who, is, uh, who was operating in the southwest of China. And this Yongli Emperor granted him the title Prince of Yanping, Yanping Wang. That's where he got this title from, or Yanping Jun Wang. So Kosinga has a, had a series of military successes in 1651 and 52. Um, and then uh, the Qing Dynasty forced Zheng Zhilong to write a letter to him from Beijing, um, urging Kosinga to surrender and negotiate with the Manchus. The long series of negotiations ultimately failed. So in August 1659, Kosinga's Ming loyalist forces fought against the, uh, the Qing army in Nanjing. The siege lasted about three weeks, beginning on 24th August, but Kosinga allowed himself to believe that the city's garrison would surrender in time and gave his opponents too much time to regroup. So eventually that led to his defeat. Um, losing his great general Kan Hui, uh, Kosinga and his rum forces slipped back to the ships and then retreated back to the islands of Jinmen and Xiamen, uh, leaving the local Ming loyalists to their fate. However, his uh, 5,000 iron men made an astounding and impressive demonstration of their formidable prowess by rendering the Manchu cavalry worthless, thereby solidifying their reputation as heavenly soldiers, Shen Bing. So I'll talk more about the iron men later on, but it's important to note that they made their contribution in the uh, Battle of Nanjing, the Battle of Guazhou already. So here is the map showing uh, Kosinga's uh, attempts to take Nanjing in 1658 and 1659. You can see that there's, there's the battle where the Iron Man showed their formidable prowess. That's Nanjing where he failed to take, which really, if he had taken Nanjing, history would have changed. But uh, unfor unfortunately, or fortunately, he did not succeed. So this is a map showing the Zheng family uh, strongholds of uh, Xiamen and Jinmen, which in uh, those times were called uh, Emoi and uh, Quemoi. Xiamen Island, and then this is the Jinmen Island. You can see in this uh, slide some Ming Dynasty matchlocks. So you can see that uh, the Ming had uh, quite uh, sophisticated rifles, matchlocks at the time. And this is a cannon of the Southern Ming which was used ostensibly to storm Fort Zealandia later on, on uh, in Taiwan. So here is a uh, depiction of the Yongli Emperor. This emperor was strangled to death by uh, Wu Sangui using, well, Wu Sangui's soldiers using a bowstring in 1662. So as his situation on the Chinese mainland increasingly became untenable, Kosinga led his troops to uh, land in uh, Lu Erman, which is uh, today's Taiwan, uh, Tainan in Taiwan, in 1661 to attack the Dutch uh, colonists. Um, Kosinga said to the Dutch then, hitherto this uh, island had always belonged to China and the Dutch had doubtless been permitted to live there, seeing that the Chinese did, did not require it for themselves. By requiring it now, it was only fair that Dutch strangers who came from far regions should give way to the masters of the island. This is a, a good uh, uh, depiction, demonstration of uh, Kosinga's propaganda, because until that time, the island was, uh, you know, the, the control of the island was in dispute. And he, uh, it didn't really belong to China. At the time, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, CK, can you move the uh, screen up more? Because look, guys, you only always show health. Okay, up the other direction, the, the other direction, up, yeah, 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 stop here. Okay, so, okay, uh, yeah, so because you so a lot of time you only show health. Okay, oh, okay, I see, yeah. So, um, after a siege of about nine months. On 1st of February 1662, the Dutch governor of the Dutch East India Company, VOC, um, Frederick Koyet, who, by the way, uh, was Swedish, not Dutch, 
but he worked for the Dutch East India Company, surrendered Fort Zealandia to Kosinga. So in the peace treaty, Kosinga was uh, called, styled in the Dutch uh, do document, Lord Deling Tsiente De Sien Khan Kotsin. It, this is like gibberish, but un unless you understand Hokkien, you will make sense of what that means. It really meant that the Dutch surrendered to the Taibeng Jiotou Tai Chong Kun Koxin in Hokkien. No, Jackie Chan. Yeah. So if you pronounce it in Hokkien, you know that the Dutch surrendered to the uh, to uh, the Ming. Uh, the CK yeah, was good, man, nigga, though. Kata bala kuchukola kasakale. Kelala. Kabala kala kabulu. Jackie Chan was good, my niggas. Y'all niggas turned up. Yeah, I know what I'm saying. Hello. Y'all fuck with me though, for sure, right? Y'all like me? Why y'all just staring at me? Just one minute. Oh. Let, me, let me take care of this. Touch your bitch ass up, nigga. What you gonna do? Hey, who is it? Huh? Nigga, I'm Bruce Lee, nigga. Can everyone mute yourself? Shut the Man. fuck up, nigga. Ah, yeah. straight. You know what I'm saying? I ain't gonna lie though, niggas. Y'all, y'all gotta teach me some shit though, for real. Shoot. Zoom bomber. No, I'm not a zoom bomber, nigga. I'm the sensei master of ching chong bachong chong. Yeah, can you? Oh, just one minute. Let me. Okay, let me see. Chill, twin. Don't kick me out though. I'm trying to learn some karate moves, nigga. Like, I'm trying to beat niggas' ass with that shit. <clears throat> Stop! Don't remove me. Let me. Please. I did. Sorry, you know. Yeah, but well, I, I was I was at the point whereby I was saying that uh, on the first of February, sixteen sixty-two, the Dutch governor surrendered to uh, Kosinga, um, surrendered Fort Zelandia to Kosinga, and in the peace treaty, Kosinga was styled uh, Lord Tebing Tiente Tesingkong Kosin, which in Dutch, but it means nothing because this is gibberish unless you uh, pronounce it in Hokkien. Which means the Dutch surrendered to the Taibeng Jiotou Tai Chong Kun Koxin, meaning they surrendered to the uh, the uh, great uh, general of the Ming Dynasty who was entrusted to accept surrender and to punish. So it really means that uh, it, it effectively ended 38 years of Dutch rule on Taiwan. It meant that the Dutch ceded Taiwan to the Ming Dynasty, that is to China. As Kosinga is the great general representing the Ming dynasty of China, authorized to accept China surrender from the Dutch and to punish the Dutch if they do not comply. So after that, Kosinga devoted himself to transforming Taiwan into a military base for loyalists for the purpose of restoring the Ming dynasty. So this is important. The Dutch, act, the Dutch surrendered not to Kosinga himself or his family. The Dutch surrendered to the Ming. This is important. So here is the uh, map showing the Kosinga's route to attack the Dutch in Taiwan. First, he came from Xiamen. Uh, well, no, he started from Jinmen in 1661. He took uh, his ships of uh, 25,000 men to the Penghu Islands. And then after that, he uh, braved a storm and then landed in uh, Luermen in uh, uh, today's Tainan in Fort Zealandia. And after a siege of nine months, took the fort and uh, expelled the Dutch from Taiwan. So this is a map showing Fort Zealandia and Fort, Fort Provincia in the uh, 17th century. You can see that there's a Bay of Taiwan in, on this map. Today, this bay no longer exists because it's been built uh, by sedimentation. So this is now uh, land. If you go to Tainan today, you will not see this bay. Um, and then here's another map. You can see that the, uh, the town of Zealandia and Fort Zealandia is built on a a uh, sand bank, which again doesn't exist today because the whole place has been uh, filled in. Um, but uh, here is the uh, the uh, Bexham boy. It's an uh, interesting, uh, funny name, which I'll explain uh, later on why it's called Bexham boy. So here, this slide shows the ruins of Fort Zealandia. You can see the uh, the uh, four hundred year old. Uh, ancient, so-called ancient uh, walls of Fort Zealandia. So here's some uh, slides showing the battles at sea. The uh, Ming forces under Kosinga defeated the Dutch Navy, VOC Navy at sea. 
and also at the Battle of uh, Baxan Boy, which really means Baxan Boy in uh, Hokkien, meaning uh, the end of the uh, northern uh, line in uh, English. The uh, Kosingar's men utterly defeated the Dutch uh, musketeers at this battle, killing half of them. Uh, in 1662, this print is the uh, depicting the surrender of Fort Zealandia to the Ming loyalists by uh, Johannes van Baden. So it shows the Dutch surrendering to the Ming forces. Here's another one: the Dutch surrendered to the surrenders to the Ming in uh, Fort Provincia Chikando today. If you go to Taiwan, and here is a uh, Ming cannon, and here is a. Uh, uh, the cannons that uh, the Dutch used in their defense of Fort uh, Zeelandia. So in 1662, Kosinga's forces raided several towns in the Philippines, and uh, the, they, he threatened to expel the Spaniards uh, from the Philippines if his demands were not bad, uh, met. So um, the Spaniards were very, very uh, jitterish after the expulsion of the Dutch from uh, from Taiwan because they thought they would be next. So after that, unfortunately for uh, Kosinga, he died of dengue fever on June the 26th, uh, June the 23rd, 1662 in uh, Chikano, which is a pro for, uh, provincia. So it's, uh, he only died uh, at a very, very young age, at the age of 37. There were speculations that he died in a sudden fit of madness when his officers refused to carry out his orders to uh, execute his son Zheng Jing. Well, his son Zheng Jing had an affair with uh, the wet nurse of one of his uh, Kosinga's young sons, thereby uh, Kosinga's honorific wife, and uh, conceive a child with her, thereby committing Confucian statutory incest, which is, uh, you know, it needs a bit of explanation, but uh, Jason can explain it better than me. The Kosinga also learned of the painful death of his father, Zheng Zhilong, and several of his half-brothers by Ling Chi, which is a very painful process. It is a death by a thousand cuts at the order of the Manchus in uh, late 1661 in fine Manchuria in Ningguta, in a very, very uh, remote area in Manchuria, which you, would, you don't want to go, I can assure you. He also knew of the strangulation by Wu Sangui of the last emperor of the Southern Ming Yongli. These terrible setbacks, and then coupled with his boat of dengue fever, was too much even for him. So he died holding uh, a plaque of the uh, first emperor of the Ming Dynasty, Hong Wu, with him. So this is a, uh, an idol of uh, Zheng Zhenggong in, in a temple dedicated to, to him in Tainan. This is uh, Chikanlo, Fort Provincia today. And now I pause for one or two questions or comments. Any questions or comments? Yeah, uh, yeah. if no, no one have one, then let me start it. Because I am currently I'm in Taiwan. Okay, so mm -hmm. uh, I just want to show the, the, the statue you see, that's the temple uh, in Taiwan. And I just, Anyone want to guess how many temple, Zheng Chen Gong's temple in Taiwan? Uh, CK, do you know how many in Taiwan? I think over 130. No, it's a, a four, four, I think it's 400. Okay. 400, okay. But, but you don't think that's very much, okay, a, a lot, but it's actually it's not a lot because Taiwan has a lot, a lot of temple. I think unofficially cut the probably 13,000. 13, so, Compared to 400, probably not that much. But anyway, <laughs> just a reference. Well, I think I can only take another question. And then those that don't have a chance to ask, let's keep your questions and uh, ask them at the end of the presentation. So one more question, please. Uh, I think it's uh, Dave who had raised his hand first. Dave. OK, very well. Uh, thank you very much, CK. A wonderful presentation. and. To take a slight detour to talk about American history, I noticed it was either Kay Moy or Matt Sue you mentioned on one of the maps. And in 1960, which was only about 60 years ago, uh, we had a presidential campaign between Jack Kennedy, who was famous as President Kennedy, 
and Richard Nixon, who had been President Eisenhower's vice president. And I think the question was, where would you draw the line about where America will defend, which even back in those days, it was an argument about defending Taiwan against uh, communist China. And Jack Kennedy drew this line and they said, oh, but what about Kim Moy and Matt Su? And I forget if he drew it on one side or the other way, because no one in the United States had even heard of Kim Moy and Matt Su. But it became a marvelous controversy. So it, I just uh, it came back in my memory about the mention of, of those two islands. Thank you very much. Sorry about you. Thank you. No worries. Uh, let me carry on. So um, talk, I'll talk a bit about the historical background. Of course, this is during the decline and fall of the Ming Dynasty, the rise of the Manchu Dynasty and the conquest of China uh, from uh, 1644 to 1683 by the, uh, by the Manchus. This also happens in, the, in a period called the First Globalization Wave. There were already prevailing maritime trade routes that were known by the Hokkien's and the Chinese in the 12th and 13th centuries. And in 1403, the Ming Dynasty started uh, sending voyages by Admiral Zheng He, uh, which uh, ended in uh, 1433, establishing many maritime links and relationships with many entities from Southeast Asia to East Africa. Some would even claim that he circumnavigated the world, but I wouldn't go that far. Uh, this epoch was followed by the Portuguese, the Dutch, the Spanish, and the English, and maybe the French in East and Southeast Asia. In colonization uh, in places like Luzon, Malacca, Java, Macau, etc., by the Europeans uh, occurred uh, alongside it. It is important to note that the Europeans did not discover the maritime trade routes from East Africa to Southeast Asia to Japan. They merely made themselves uh, middlemen, intermediaries, by injecting their forces uh, by force as, uh, or by guile as middlemen into these pre existing trade routes that operated way before, long before the Europeans arrived on the scene. Oh, it, it also happened during the time of the creation of the inter-Asian trade between the Macau, Ming China, Nagasaki, Japan, Manila, Luzon, Vietnam, Siam, Malacca, Batavia, and by the Hokkien's, by the Ryukians, by the Portuguese, Dutch, Spanish, Japanese, etc. So it's an international arena where many players uh, played. Um, Kosinga was also at the end of the uh, East-West military parity, where Asians at the time, by the end of the 17th century, were still, were still able to hold their own against the European powers. So after the 17th century, Asians increasingly fell behind in military innovation, resulting finally in the central century of humiliation for China and the colonization of much of Asia by the European powers in the 19th century and subsequently also the 20th century. So here, this slide uh, is a, shows the trade routes that were known to the uh, Hokkien Chinese in the 13th century. You can see that uh, they have already traversed places like Champa, um, Angkor, in uh, the Sumatra, Java, and in places like the Spice Islands, which is called the Maluku Islands. Um, and they even knew the trade route to India. So the Hokkien's were very, very well versed in the uh, sea routes of the um, South China Sea in, of, the, uh, of Southeast Asia and uh, Indian Ocean by the 12th century. And this map shows uh, Admiral Zheng He's seven more voyages. You can see that uh, he went as far as uh, Malindi and Mogadishu in uh, the Horn of Africa. And this map shows the European voyages of discovery the Europeans discovered the world for themselves, but some parts of the world already were discovered before the Europeans rediscovered them for the Europeans. Um, then for the, uh, this is a map showing the uh, commodities that was being traded in Asian Africa by uh, the Portuguese and by the Dutch. You can see that Japan contributed mostly silver and China uh, in terms of uh, paper, porcelain and uh, silk textiles. And then there were cinnamon, other things like glass, copper, textiles, and horses that were traded. And here is the uh, very important Manila Acapulco galleon uh, trade route that the Spanish used to bring um, goods from the New World, such as potatoes uh, and uh, tomatoes, 
um, as well as uh, um, silver, Spanish silver, which the Ming Dynasty increasingly used to uh, East Asia. This is an important trade route that the Spanish utilize. It's called the Mani Manila Acapulco trade route. And this map shows the holdings of the Dutch and the Portuguese, who obviously hated each other. And you can see that the Dutch uh, control Deshima, Malacca, Amboina, and Jakarta, which is Batavia. And they have a lot of holdings in Sri Lanka and Southern India. But the Portuguese, by the time, had their holding in Malacca um, conquered by the Dutch. And the Dutch also tried to take Macau, and which they didn't succeed. So the Portuguese had a much reduced presence after the arrival of the Dutch. So that's a uh, historical uh, issue between the Portuguese and the Dutch. And they didn't like each other because they shared um, differences in religious views as well. The Dutch, as you can see from this map, had an empire in blue and they con conquered and they operated some of the trade routes. And they were the, you know, the preeminent maritime power or mar the preeminent European mar maritime power in the 17th century. Uh, they operated with a very secure base in uh, what is today's Indonesia, which is uh, which they call uh, the capital Batavia, which is today's Jakarta. So here is a slide comparing the uh, ships of the Ming and the Dutch in the 17th century. You could see that for the Ming, they also have broadsides. They also have cannons mounted. So they are not technologi technologically that far off from the Dutch ships. So they were able to, uh, to kind of uh, match the Dutch vessel by vessel, man by man for man. So the Ming was uh, technologically, I would say, almost on par with the Dutch. So in terms of military technology, uh, China and the Dutch were not really that far apart. So now I move on to the family background. Um, his mother, Zheng Chenggong's mother, was um, Tagawa Matsu. Um, he had a, she also had a son called Tagawa Chichizemo, and uh, whom she left in uh, Hirado. She was a Japanese of uh, um, samurai origins, and actually she's of a uh, Ashigaru samurai, meaning a foot soldier samurai, the lowest samurai rank. And uh, she lived most of her life in the coastal town of Hirado then later on moved to China. She gave birth to Zheng Sen, meaning Zheng Kosang Kosinga, during a trip with her husband, uh, Zheng Zhilong, when she was picking seashells on the Senli village, Senai River Bank in Hirado. And she gave him the Japanese name of Fukumatsu. And Zheng Zhilong gave uh, Kosinga the Chinese name Zheng Sen. So there's a stone plaque um, today, which I still exists today, called the uh, Kosinga Child Birth Stone Tablet. Zheng Chenggong Er Dan Shi Bei in uh, Hirado, in, uh, which I'll show you in a later slide. He had another son called Shi Zemu in 1629, and uh, she gave him the family surname Tagawa. So this uh, Zheng Chenggong's uh, brother later became an Ashigaru samurai as well. In 1645, uh, Miss Tagawa moved to Quanzhou, Fujian, and was reunited with Kosinga. Then she moved to Anping in Quanzhou later on and uh, met her death there by suicide. Um, so in 1647, when the Kosinga was away fighting the Manchus, Anping city was invaded by the Manchus. And Kosinga, upon hearing of the invasion, returned to Quanzhou immediately, only to discover that uh, Miss Tagawa, his mother, uh, had committed suicide. Uh, one particular Lee Dyer account states that Miss Tagawa was violated by Manchu soldiers when she tried to distract them from preying on other female members of the Zheng household, including Kosinga's own wife. She committed suicide afterwards in shame. Kosinga was beside himself for after discovering her mother's body upon his return to Anping. And in his mind, in order to cleanse his mother's honor, he opened up Miss Tagawa's abdomen and washed her entrails with water before burying her. After this horrific episode, Kosinga vowed not to coexist and never to coexist with the Manchus under the same sky. 
in Chinese is very, very uh, important because he saw, he saw that he and the Manchus will be This is a very uh, strong message in Chinese that you won't uh, live under the same sky with, uh, with another group of people. So this is uh, Kosinga's place of birth in uh, Hirado. You can see this is the stone where he apparently was uh, brought to earth in 1661. And this is the statue of uh, Lady Tagawa and the uh, young child Kosinga on the grounds of the Zhengchenggong Museum in Hirado, Japan. And I have here a slide showing the uh, Ashigaru Lightfoot uh, Samurai in various uh, dress for your entertainment. So his father, Kosinga's father, is known as Zheng Zhilong. Uh, he is also known as uh, Nicholas Ikuan Gaspard because Zheng Zhilong was a Catholic who was baptized in Macau. Um, he was uh, he was from Nanan uh, province, Nanan uh, prefecture in the uh, Fujian province of China, um, and he was uh, eventually executed because he failed to dissuade and persuade. Sorry, he failed to persuade Kosinga to uh, surrender to the Manchus. So this Zheng Zhilong was a very colorful character himself. So it's uh, maybe a, worthy of another presentation on Zheng Zilong himself, but not today. Here is a print, Japanese print, showing Lady Takawa, Kosinga, and Zheng Zilong. And you can see that uh, the Japanese by the 17th or 18th centuries were already very aware of Kosinga, which is why he had prints made. They had uh, prints made of uh, Kosinga and his exploits. Unfortunately, this, uh, this, this print wasn't very accurate because if you look, there is this word called Changchi, meaning the Japanese uh, printer who created this print thought Lady Ta uh, Miss Tagawa was a prostitute or courtes courtesan, which was completely false because uh, um, Kosinga's mother, uh, Miss Tagawa Matsu, was not a prostit prostitute and she was not a courtesan. She was a... Uh, uh, a lady of uh, Ashigaru samurai origins. So that's a mistake, but you know, that's a, there's a lot of hearsay going on then. And then there's a Japanese prince also uh, extolling Zheng Zhilong's uh, gunnery prowess. You can see this is Zheng Zhilong, Nicholas Ikuan Gaspard with a huge uh, rifle. See, a huge rifle, a huge, uh, perhaps uh, bazooka in today's, uh, you know, today's uh, parlance. So it shows his military powers. Kosinga Zheng Zhilong, uh, sorry, Zheng Chenggong has a sister or had a sister by the name of Ursula de Burgas, whose Chinese name is no longer available to us. Um, this sister was uh, from the same father and uh, was uh, from the same mother, Takawa Matsu. And uh, she was Catholic. She was born in uh, in in Hirado, but uh, during the sixteen during sixteen thirty six, she went back to uh, well, didn't went back. She arrived in Macau because of the relig religious persecutions going on in Japan. Um, but incidentally, Macau was the Portuguese corruption of a Hokkien pronunciation of the temple of the sea god Matsu. So if the the uh, according to folklore, when the Portuguese first landed in Macau, they found a Hokkien person there next to a temple, which is still there today. And the Portuguese asked this uh, Hokkien person, "What, what, what, what is the name of the place?" And because they didn't understand each other, the uh, Hokkien person thought he was asking about the name of the temple. So he said, "Oh, Macau." So then the Portuguese thought it's Macau. So that's how we got the name Macau. Okay, from. Uh, Hokkien, really. So this is St. Paul's Cathedral in uh, Macau, or the facade of the St. Paul's Cathedral in Macau. Uh, it's interesting to note that the St. Paul's Cathedral was built by Japanese Catholics from Nagasaki. So the Japanese Catholics uh, actually were the ones who built the St. Paul's Cathedral in Macau. Um, 
So other relations like the son Zheng Jing, who ruled uh, Taiwan, and grandson Zheng Keshuang ruled Taiwan from, well, governed Taiwan. They ruled in the name of the Ming Dynasty, but they governed Taiwan from 1662 to 1683. And uh, Ms. Tagawa Matsu's descendants through Kosinga lived in both mainland China and Taiwan. Um, one of the great son was uh, Zheng Kuan, uh, but uh, uh, Zheng Daoshun was the son of Shi Qi Zemon, and he adopted the Zheng surname in Japan. Um, one of Tagawa's Chinese descendants, um, Zheng Xiaolan, was the father of Zheng Chouyu. Zheng Chouyu was a still is a famous poet who was born in Shandong province in China. And he called himself a child of the resistance against Japan. And uh, here is uh, he he wrote many poems. And this is a uh, uh, photograph of uh, Zheng Chouyu, Zheng Chenggong's direct descendant. So I pause here for one or two questions. Uh, if no questions, I'll just carry on. So I move to... Uh... I've got a question from earlier, if I may. Okay, if you could, yeah. Okay, it was just the map that, that was uh, showing the Shanghai Pass and then south was Beijing. Yes. So that's not Shanghai, Shanghai then, is it? Cause no, Shanghai... no, 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 that's not Shanghai. It's called a Shanghai. Shanghai. Oh, okay, I miss it. Meaning mountain and sea pass. Got it. Yeah, okay, that makes a lot more sense now. Thank you. <laughs> There's nothing to do with Shanghai. Yeah, it's, so uh, I thought the geography was way off, but you know, okay, go yeah. better. Thanks. Yeah, okay. Oh, no worries. Does Mark have a hand up? Yeah, hi. Thanks, Jason. Um, yeah, CK. Um, so kind of to help me contextualize the uh the discussion. I'm wondering, um, or the presentation, I'm wondering if you could share, like, um, what it is about Zhang and Chenggong that, like, you like the most, like, what do you figure to be his most outstanding trait or historical contribution, and what about him do you dislike the most? Uh, well, so far, well, I can say I like him most for his uh, courage in the face of adversity. Um, I don't have anything that I dislike about him, so I I I actually like the man. So if if that's for, that's why I'm presenting him. Otherwise, I wouldn't do it. Okay. So then uh, I will just carry on. So I would like to uh, mention a bit of his uh, three of his special military units, which is very uh, interesting to me. The first one is called the Iron Man Battalion, which I'm sure none of you have heard of. These were amongst the finest troops the Ming loyalists had to offer. And officially, they were known as the Wu Wei Zhen and the Hu Wei Zhen, uh, meaning the uh, Marshal Guard Garrison and the Tiger Guard Garrison. And they were both uh, commanded by two generals, one called uh, Chen Kui, another called Chen Zhe. Um, so uh, it's a, uh, in terms of their organization, the uh, Ironmen were organized into the left and right, uh, Hu Wei Zhen and Wu, Wu, Wu Wei Zhen. And they were uh, Kosinga's guards and crack troops. They numbered around three to 5,000, and then uh, recruitment increased later on to around 10,000. During battle, they usually fought in mixed six man squads consisting of uh, two Rattan shieldmen, two pikemen, one uh, ironman wielding uh, what is called a Zhan uh, Ma Dao, uh, and then uh, three supporting porters. And um, each squad would, could be further divided into two three-man cells that operated independently. Sometimes they were also uh, included, uh, um, they included pikemen. So one, uh, every ironman was also an archer. They were usually organized into archer contingent and close combat contingent with a ratio of four to six. Such was the fearsome reputation of the Iron Man that they were highly respected by Kosinga's other troops and dreaded by their Manchu and Dutch enemies. They were known to be disciplined, fierce, and fearless to the point of recklessness and demonstrated many impressive battlefield feats to back up this reputation. The Iron Man had withstood uh, repeated cavalry charges by a superior number of uh, Manchu heavy cavalry, utilized smoke screen to counter charge and defeat said cavalry, and ignored seemingly debilitating arrow wounds, and weathered through severe Dutch bombardment without faltering. 
They were also noted for their skill in archery and ability to maintain good formation order by Dutch witnesses. So in spite of this fearlessness, they were not headstrong, they were not suicidal, they were perfectly willing to regroup, uh, disengage, and then dive for cover when ordered. So for the equipment, they had uh, terrifying tiger faces painted on their shields and helmets. They were garbed in a uh, heavy steel mail, mail from uh, head to knee. They had to move, you know, they had uh, to prove their skill with lances, shields, and uh, bow and arrow. And they need to demonstrate that uh, they are equipped and able to uh, demonstrate sword play with a 50 pound, about 23 kilogram sword. It's a bloody heavy sword. Um, but their weapon of choice was the Jan Ma Tao. They were heavily armored, wearing an iron helmet, iron mask, and uh, they often served as, as Marines and participated in amphibious assault and boarding action. So for their recruitment and training, they were only recruited from the strongest men. One must be able to walk three laps around a training field while carrying a three to 500 catties, meaning 150 to 250 kilograms stone lion which is amazing, 150 to 250 kilograms stone lion. Um, in order to be eligible for recruitment, I wouldn't want to, to, to volunteer. So once recruited, they went through rigorous military training to better prepare them for war. They were drilled twice a day in full gear and can get extremely hot and, uh, well, with sandbags tied to their legs and underwent performance assessment every other day with particular emphasis on archery. So for some examples of uh, battlefield uh, exploits, for example, in the first example, at the Battle of Guazhou in, uh, next to Nanjing, the uh, Iron Men were known to common soldiers as the Shen Ding or warriors of the gods. Um, they had a uh, tiny slit in the helmet allowed, which allowed them to see um, the Iron Man's armor was all but impervious to lances and swords. Reports from both sides of the campaign certified the, the Iron Man as bulletproof. Their job was to stand in front of the troops like a metal wall armed with long, long pikes designed for taking down horses, therefore the Jan Ma Dao really and many wielded a formidable battle sword fitted into a stick half the length of a man. Considering the weight of the armor and the heavy horse-killing weapons and the fact that it was the height of the summer, the Iron Man must have been truly superhuman. So the Manchu cavalry flung themselves in vain against the unstoppable wall of the advancing armor. When the Manchu line broke and ran, the battle turned into a massacre. The Iron Man won handsomely against the Manchu cavalry in this battle. Um, the second example is the Battle of Baxam Boy or, uh, in, in Tainan, in a uh, sandbank north of Fort Zelandia in 1661. So this Dutch captain, Thomas Pedel, led his 240 musketeers to face uh, Kosinga's Ironman forces, uh, fully expecting an, a walkover. And with military precision, the Dutch uh, musketeers marched within range of the Chinese firing three-time volleys of musket balls at them. Thomas Paddle fully expected the Chinese to break ranks and ran. But the Chinese front line comprised the famous Iron Man, who simply shrugged off the musket fire and held their ground. And then Kosinga's Iron Man archers fired arrows into the Dutch ranks and outflanked them. And uh, those Dutch soldiers who stood their ground were crushed by the Iron Man, while 118 Dutch musketeers were slaughtered in broad, broad daylight. So that taught them a lesson to underestimate their enemy. Right? So in terms of Dutch uh, painting, this is an Iron Man uh, soldier holding the Chan Ma Tao in the uh, horse chopping saber. This is a Dutch painting. You can see the Iron Man with the Chan Ma Tao fully uh, armored from head to toe. The Jan Ma Tao horse uh, chopping saber here is shown, not, 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 not this uh, instrument, it's the one next to this, next to it, this one. This is the uh, horse wielding, horse chopping saber, the Jan Ma Tao. And this is a print, and this is the uh, Iron Man 
possibly the Iron Man depicting the surrender of the Dutch to uh, Kosinga in uh, 1662. And the Battle of Vaxenboy, you can see the Dutch on this side and the uh, Chinese on this side with the uh, archers firing into the Dutch. So the second unit I want to talk about, which is very, very uh, important, but very not very well known, is what is called the uh, Black Guard. So they are um, recruited from Macau initially by Kosinga's father, Zheng Zhilong, from the Portuguese. And uh, some of them were from Africa. Some of them were uh, Indians. And uh, because uh, probably of Dravidian origins, because uh, otherwise they wouldn't be called a Black Guard. So um, their organization is as such, with many of its members unable to speak any languages but Portuguese. The Black Guard was uh, Zheng Zhilong's uh, most trusted unit, and he confided more in them than in the Chinese and always kept them near his person as his Praetorian Guard. And they were lo fiercely loyal to Zheng Zhilong and then subsequently to Zheng Chenggong. As you can see, as I've said earlier, 30 of the Black Guard died to the last man, protecting Zheng Zhilong from being captured by the Manchus. So they were extremely loyal. For the equipment, they were specialists in the use and maintenance of what is called the Tanegashima uh, matchlocks um, purchased from Japan. They were also able to produce these rifles, known in Chinese as the war chong, meaning Japanese guns later on. The mere fact that they were present struck fear into um, the enemies of Kosinga. And rumors spread that devils have joined Zheng Zhilong's forces at Anping, even uh, Kosinga. Um, then, you know, the fact that the, the Chinese and Manchus have not seen black people, you know, it really caused some fear, panic when they see these, uh, the, the, these soldiers. So um, there is this uh, fear factor from, by the mere fact of having them around. In terms of the leadership, they were very well led they, were, they carried a banner with the image of the Virgin Mary, uh, prominently displayed. It was uh, led by a very talented uh, man called Luis de Matos. They were usually deployed on the second line in support of the first line of fence. In the siege of Nanjing, they were seen fighting at the foot of the city walls near the Yangtze River. And in the siege of Fort Zealandia, uh, Kosinga's black soldiers, black guards, were able to communicate with the blacks enslaved by the Dutch inside the fort and, and, uh, uh, and uh, sort of uh, persuaded many of them to defect, to join the uh, Kosinga's army. So in terms of the aftermath, nobody really knew what happened to the black guard battalion and their families. Some presumably have uh, married Chinese wives after the demise of uh, of uh, Kosinga's kingdom, well, the Ming, the Ming kingdom in, in Taiwan in 1683. Um, it was very unlikely they were sent to mainland China or repatriated to Macau, even back to Africa or Asia. Um, possibly they uh, intermarried and their descendants uh, probably still live in Taiwan today. In terms of their influence on the island of Jinmen, there was this uh, where the Black Guard was stationed in with Kosinga in the 1650s and 1660s. There remains today a local slang called uh, Black Bellied Barbarian, meaning Otto Huan. Meaning, you know, if you go to Jinmen and somebody says that you are an Otto Huan, it means that you are an unreasonable or incorrigible person. Presumably because they couldn't communicate with the local in inhabitants, you know, they didn't understand them. So if you can't communicate, you know, you become an unreasonable person. But the slang still uh, exists today in Jinmen. So here is a Dutch print of uh, Kosinga and Black Guard. You can see this, uh, this is Kosinga, and this is his Black Guard with a saber. You know, obviously very uh, colorful print, but uh, it, it bears no real resemblance to uh, Zheng Chenggong, of course. And here is the image of the Virgin Mary carried by the Black Guard in battle. And here is an example of the Tanegashima gun. Then finally, I want to talk about the bamboo shield soldiers, what is called Tung Piping and other elite uh, military formation in Zheng Chenggong. 
there are three principal equipment used by them. It, by this, uh, um, you can they have the Yao Dao and they have the Biao Qiang javelin and the sword. So originating from Fujian province, the Teng Pai was one of the more common shields used by uh, by uh, soldiers in the south, by the Ming army soldiers in the south. So the average size of the Ming rattan shield is about 83 centimeters to 100 centimeters. For some battlefield examples, at the Battle of Baxomboy in 1661, following the decimation of some of the Dutch musketeers led by Captain Thomas Peddle, uh, the Teng Pai soldiers charged and crushed even more of the remaining Dutch. So the governor of Fort Zealandia, Frederick Coyette, who was watching the battle from the safety distance of the fort, uh, wrote in this belief, with bent heads and their bodies hidden behind their shields, they tried to break through the opposing ranks with such fury and courage, as if each one still had a spare body at home. They continually pressed for onwards. Many were shot down, not stopping to consider, but ever rushing forward like mad dogs, not even looking around to see whether they are followed by their comrades or not. So for the second example, this uh, Teng Pai Bing was used in, by the Manchus after the Zheng forces surrendered in 1683 to the Manchus in uh, lifting the siege of uh, Elbazin in the 1680s against the Tsarist Russia. So uh, one witness account says the, uh, that the, uh, the Marquis Lin, Lin Xingzhu, which is the uh, commander of the, uh, the Teng Pai Bing, ordered the Marines into the water and uh, each wore a rattan shield on his head and held a huge sword on his hands. Then the Russians were so frightened, they all shouted, behold, the big cap tartans are here. Since our Marines were in the water, they could not use their firearms. Our sailors wore rattan shields to protect their heads so that enemy bullets and arrows could not pierce them. So our Marines, the Teng Pai Bing, used long swords to cut the enemy's ankles. The Russians fell into the river, most of them either killed or wounded. The rest fled and escaped. Lin Xingzhu had not lost a single Marine when he returned uh, to take part in besieging uh, Yakasa, which is Elbazin in, in Russia. So here is the uh, Ming Dynasty military manual showing a bamboo shield. So it exists, I didn't make this up. And then has a military manual of the Ming Dynasty showing a soldier or a, an individual with the bamboo shield. And here is a uh, photo, well, no, painting of a bamboo shield soldiers operating under the Qing Dynasty, the Manchus. You can see this is the uh, uh, bamboo shield soldiers with his uh, bamboo shield. And here is a map of Sino-Russian conflicts in the 17th century. So the Battle of Elbazin is over here. And the uh, Manchus or the Chinese defeated the Russians in that battle. So I stop here for one or two questions and to catch my breath. Any questions? If not, I will proceed. The next one is the most interesting part of this presentation. Since we are in the Asian philosophy group, I thought I should talk about the philosophies guiding Zheng Chenggong's life. So the first one, which is important, is called the loyalty to the Lord. In Chinese, it's called Zhong Jun. And I have to say that Zheng Chenggong didn't, didn't say all these philosophies himself. I distilled it. I'm the one who, told, who said he had these philosophies and you could disagree or, dis or, or agree. But uh, any mistakes are totally mine. So Kosinga, Zheng Zhenggong, was raised by her mother to be loyal and studied Confucianism in its fundamentalist sense, where he really and truly believed in what he was taught by Qian Qian Yi in Nanjing. I have to say that this, this Qian Qian Yi, this great for Confucian scholar, after teaching Zheng Chenggong how to be loyal and filial, himself defected to the Manchus. So this was a great blow to the, uh, to, to, to the young uh, Kosinga because his own teacher, whom he uh, adored and admired, did not practice what he preached. Um, so Kosinga never once wavered in his loyalty to the me, which is a home hallmark of his life. He chose to be a loyal subject and is true to his dynasty to the very end. So on June 23rd, 1662, Kosinga, 
ill with dengue fever, donned his ceremonial robes when he heard of the death of Emperor Yongli by the turncoat Wu Sangui. He staggered to his personal family shrine, erected in Fort Zealandia, where the ancestral tablets of his mother and father took second place to a memorial written by the founding emperor of the Ming dynasty, Zhu Yuanzhang, the Emperor Hongwu. So he took the Ming memorial, lifted it with great reverence, bowed his head before it, and sobbed. Looking at his followers with him and, and with his last breath, he cried, how could I meet my emperor in heaven with my mission unfulfilled? So Zheng Chenggong reportedly passed away, clutching the Ming memorial in his hands. And with him, ended the spirit of Ming resistance and ended the spirit of Ming loyalism. The second thing I want to say about his philosophy is something called throwing away the pen and joining the military. In Chinese, it's called Tobi Songrong. Um, Kosinga was a very serious student. In fact, too serious. His father sent him to study for embellishment. So his father wanted him to get some education, but he didn't want him to be so serious because Zheng Zhilong was a, an entrepreneur. He just wanted his son to get some um, you know, degrees and then to be able to further his family's fortunes. But Kosinga was serious. He really believed in what he was taught. So, um, but found that there was no way of studying or becoming a Confucian scholar when all under heaven was in chaos. As such, emulating, emulating the Han scholar and general, Ban Chao, he became a soldier and had his first foray in 1646 when Emperor Longwu sent him to repel a Manchu attack on Fujian province. The third one, which is a, a, a great uh, propaganda or public relations coup, was what was known, known as burning his Confucian robes, Fen Ru Jin. So after the death of uh, Kosinga's mother in 1647, Zheng Chenggong was on the edge and he was very furious, but he was also a master in public relations. So according to legend, um, Zheng Chenggong openly burned his Confucian robes at a temple in Anping, his uh, family home, and vowed to avenge his lord and his mother. He renounced all scholarly pursuits thereafter and officially took up arms against the Manchu invaders. The fourth uh, trait is what I call uh, loyalty and filial piety cannot coexist. And in Chinese, it's called zhong xiao bu neng liang quan. So Kosinga refused to surrender to the Manchus, despite the example of his father, Zheng Zhilong, or Nicholas Gaspard Iquan, or, or Nicholas Iquan Gaspard, to be correct, who defected and was held under house arrest by the Manchus in Beijing. He swore absolute loyalty to the Ming dynasty and his empress, Longwu, and later Yongli, and disregarded his father and his brothers pleas to defect, showing what and where his priorities were. The fifth element is what I call upholding righteousness and exterminating kinship. Da yi mie qin. So Kosinga, by refusing to surrender to the Manchus, effectively sent his father, his brothers, and uncle to their deaths at the hands of the Manchus. Although deeply troubled, Kosinga was steadfast in his refusal to submit and continued the Ming loyalist struggle showing that he valued loyalty and righteousness above kinship any day. So too bad for Nicholas Gaspard, uh, Iquan Gaspard. You know, he has a, a son who was very loyal to the emperor and the dynasty. So bye-bye, Nicholas. So the sixth one is uh, called a saying, although there are tens of millions of other people, I'm the one who forged ahead. In Chinese, it's called sui qian wan ren, qian wan ren. Wu Wang Yi. So Kosinga had an image of himself as a hero of the times. He therefore puts himself forward and soldiered on against all odds. Even if there are many thousands of others, he considered himself the one who rose to the occasion. So number seven is what I call holding back the powerful waves to prevent total collapse. In Chinese, it's called Li Wan Huang Lan Yu Ji Dao. So after the death of Emperor Yongli in 1662, 
Koxinga was the only force standing between the Manchus and their total conquest of China. He was the sole big wood holding back the, back the uh, Manchu tide. Number eight is called the uh, to avenge the insults to my nation and my family, I shall not share the same sky with the Manchus. In Chinese, it's called Guo Chou Jia Hen, Wu Gong Dai Tian. So Zheng Chengkong had a deep, burning, and profound hatred of the Manchus and the Han Chinese collaborators. He wanted to avenge the deaths of Empress Hong Guang, Long Wu, and Yong Li, the deaths of his father, Zheng Zhilong, brothers, and in particular, his dear mother, Tagawa Matsu. His hatred will not cease until the Manchus are driven out of China. And to that goal, he spurred his followers on. That, well, theirs is the, was the only force greater than the force of love. There is only one force greater than the force of love, and that is the force of hate. Kosinga embodies and exemplifies this force of hate against his Manchu ne nemesis, and he was powered by this force of hate. The ninth one is called uh, sacrificing one's life for justice, a very Confucian saying, Sha shen cheng ren, she shen qu yi. So he extolled his troops and generals to fight to the end for the main cause. He was very harsh to those who ran away from battle and who was defeated by the Manchus. If his soldiers did not die fighting, he would exterminate them himself. Known for extreme, extremely stern and harsh discipline, Kosinga pushed his troops sometimes too far. For not everyone is as Confucian as he was, and not everyone was raised in the Ashigaru Samurai values of total devotion to one's lord, which uh, Miss Tagawa incul inculcated in Kosinga from young. For example, one of his commander, Tsai Fei, came and reported that the Manchus has routed him on the battlefield. So Kosinga ordered Tsai Fei beheaded, and his head was put on a stake and displayed to his troops. Kosinga had military inspectors who carried flags with grim words, with these grim words. In the front ranks, those who disobey will be beheaded. Those who retreat will also be beheaded. So commanders and generals who were not spared, the military pol policy was execute first, report later. So these were extremely severe military discipline and I wouldn't be, want to be in one of his troops. So the last one, another last one, now, number 10 is what I call better dead than red. Ning wei yu sui bu wei wa quan. So Kosinga believed wholeheartedly, as I already said in the Ming loyalist cause, he would go for broke instead of surrendering to preserve his forces. His troops personified this value in the sense that they were brave, suicidal, and almost fanatical in war. Kosinga did not consider the surrender of his men to the other side kindly. He was gracious to his foes, but harsh towards his men, especially turncoats. At the age of 11, Kosinga already mastered one of the most difficult books in the Confucian canon, the Chunqiu. It is the most martial of the classics, portraying an ancient world of loyalty, honor, and valor, quite like the samurai world of his childhood. Loyalty and righteousness, which were part of the samurai code, were qualities Kosinga felt were lacking in the China of his days. Those, these were the same qualities that he felt were lacking in his own father. So he lamented, in ancient times, righteousness was always more valued than family loyalty. And ever since I learned to read, I always admired the righteousness of the spring and autumn period. Number 11 is called... Knowing the impossibility of the objective, I nevertheless carried on striving for it. So by 1662, after the conquest of Fort Zealandia and expulsion of the Dutch, Kosinga seemed to realize that the Ming loyalist cause was quite hopeless, as he, he was the only remaining force resisting the Manchus. After the great removal decrees, the Chinese coast was laid waste and Kosinga's forces faced tremendous hardships securing vital supplies. By 1662, his domain was restricted to the islands of Xiamen and Jinmen, Penghu, and the southwestern part of Taiwan. The mainland was lost. The situation was quite hopeless. But Kosinga convinced himself that as a man of destiny, he had to do the impossible and soldiered on to his death. 
this was a very different Kosinga from 1659 on the eve of uh, conquering Nanjing, which never happened. He wrote a poem translated badly by me as follows. Wearing a white funeral attire by the Yangtze River, I vow to exterminate the Manchus. With 100,000 men, my forces could swallow the territory of Wu. Looking at the natural defensive barrier of the river Yangtze, I threw my whip and crossed without issue. I shall not believe that the central plains will not belong to the imperial surname of Zhu. So in Chinese, which sounds much better than in English, it goes like this. That was his ambition. Finally, it is the unity of thought and action that most impressed me about Kosinga. Kosinga exemplifies some parts of uh, Wang Shouren, Wang Yangming's philosophy of mind, where thought has to be accompanied by the necessary action. In his understanding of the quest to restore the Ming dynasty, Kosinga extolled his men to push themselves to the limit, and he often led by example. Therefore, he was not simply a Confucian scholar who studied the classics for their own sake. He was a Confucian scholar warrior who combined thoughts with actions. Kosinga may subconsciously have been influenced by Wang Yangming's philosophy when he was in Hirado, as the samurai were much impressed by Yomei Gaku, meaning Yang Ming Xue, and this philosophy may have trickled down to the even lowly Ashigaru samurai. It was not certain whether Kosinga was studying Yang, or Wang Yangming's brand of, of Confucianism when he was back in Quanzhou or when he was studying with uh, the Confucian scholar Qian Qianyi. But being a bright, serious, and earnest student, Zheng Chenggong most likely must have been aware of Wang Yangming's philosophy. So his life exemplifies this philosophy and would have done Wang Yangming very proud. So here, this slide shows a giant statue of Zheng Chenggong at Wulangyu Xiamen. And here is a bust of uh, Zheng Chenggong in uh, Fort Zealandia in uh, Anping Gubao today. And here is a, uh, an idol of him at one of the uh, temples in Tainan. And here are statues depicting the surrender of the Dutch to Kosinga at uh, Chikan Lo in Tainan. So I can take a four or five questions or comments, if you have any, before I proceed to uh, the next segment. Yeah, Fred, please. Um, it's As I recall, this is kind of around the time, it seems, that um, there was a movement afoot in Chinese philosophy by, who was it, Yan Yuan, I think? And, and and others to kind of purge neo-Confucianism uh, and get back to the roots of Confucianism. Is, is that about the same time? Because it sounds like that's kind of what he's doing, going back to the earliest works of Confucianism. Uh, I'm not sure uh, about the times you're talking about. That at the, in the 17th century, um, that was after the emergence of... Uh, Wang Yangming and his, uh, his, his, his take on Confucian philosophy. Um, I'm not uh, familiar with the other character you, you mentioned, so I can't comment on that. But uh, I hope uh, you know, there are other more distinguished authorities who could answer that question. So uh, one, please. The other, yeah, the other question I have, just trying to sort out uh, yes. Confucianism, really, and uh, Neo-Confucianism. It, it's always seemed to me that Confucianism valued both uh, loyalty to your your nation and loyalty to your family. And here we have a kind of a conflict between the two. And I wonder how that sorts out, why, why he seems to so strongly emphasize loyalty to um, to to his nation versus filial loyalty? Well, my understanding of uh, Zheng Zhenggong's uh, view is that the loyalty to the Lord, the loyalty to the dynasty must come 
before loyalty to one's family. So if there is such a thing called a greater loyalty and a smaller loyalty. So he in when both are in conflict, the greater loyalty takes precedence over the smaller loyalty. Um, you. You're welcome. So Quan next, please. Uh, first, I want to say, CK, that your presentation is absolutely outstanding and comprehensive. The other thing that I would take 10 seconds to answer to Dave, um, loyalty has to be understood as the personal decision of a free man. Okay? Uh, during the imperial times, uh, you have a hierarchy, as CK just said, that you have the Da Zhong and the Xiao Zhong. However, the true answer to that is your own independent and free reflection. Some people will decide for the great loyalty, like in the case of Zheng Chongkong, and some people would decide for the small loyalty. It's a question of personal and free decision, uh, which is, after all, the true teaching of the epistemological uh, journey of the Confucian school, meaning you have to expand your mind, you have to be free, and after you take your decision according to your own individuality and according to the circumstances. That being said, I want to say that what you are talking about, when you talk about the philosophy of uh, Ko Xing Ya, uh, two characters spring spontaneously to my mind, one of European history and one of Chinese history. The one of European history involves also an island, okay, the island of Corsica, because uh, Napoleon Bonaparte, uh, chose also a greater uh, cause than his, than his uh, native island of Corsica <coughs> because he identified himself to France that he viewed as a more a worthier a model land, a worthier spiritual model land uh, than his uh, island of Corsica. A little bit like Kusinga having identified himself to the great Ming Empire as something that he aspired to. And I suppose that for having received uh, the title Zhao Tao, Zhao Tao, Zhao Jun from the Ming, and translated as Shogun in Japanese, must have a certain impact on his psyche. Because after all, he was being granted the same rank than the supreme leader of the land where he was born. So I suppose that psychologically it must have a certain impact. The character from Chinese history that would spring spontaneously from my mind is the supposed biological father of the first emperor, uh, Liu Pu Wei. And Liu Pu Wei himself was from a merchant background, but uh, having been accepted within the Qin nobility, you know that Liu Pu Wei uh, has been granted the mission to destroy the Zhou dynasty that 800 years long dynasty, having been at the center of the creation of Chinese civilization, Lu Pu Wei, that man from a merchant background has been granted the mission to destroy the Zhou dynasty, mission he fulfilled since he destroyed the royal house in 256 BCE. And by that mere fact, I would say elevated himself to true aristocracy. So. I would say that here is the very interesting psychological, emotional, spiritual adventures of two men separated by 18 centuries or so practically two millennia, having been, let's say, that's my standpoint, of course, and it's debatable, from a lowly merchant perspective to a true aristocratic perspective uh, where he served for the good of the nations. And third, and third point and last point, uh, the fact that he received a surrender uh, from the Dutch uh, for, for Zealandia, I would say that from the legal standpoint, it would be the first event justifying that Taiwan is legally the possession of China since the present Chinese government is the legal successor to the Ming Empire and the legal successor to the Qing Empire and the legal successor to the Chinese Republic uh, before 1949. I stopped here. Yeah, I agree. 
So uh, next one is uh, Mark. Mark, please. Yeah, sorry, I had a little bit of trouble finding my microphone. Yeah, thanks a lot for the presentation, CJ. I didn't know really hardly any any of this, maybe 2% of what you said. So it was fascinating for me historically. Um, so I have maybe a couple questions and, and maybe a comment based on what you say. So my first question is, um, do you know anything about um, um, Koshing Ha's um, attitude towards Sun Tzu? Have you read anything where he, where he talks about Sun Tzu or Sun Tzu's military ideas? Uh, no, I haven't read anything on that. No. Okay, because the reason why this comes to mind is because, like, like what you talked about, the extreme discipline and the punishment of soldiers for retreating is um, really interesting um, to me from a military and political standpoint, because the failure to retreat is one of the most common military mistakes, I think, in history, with often catastrophic results. Um, to give uh, three quick examples, the Battle of Kiev in World War II, where Stalin refused to allow the Soviet armies to retreat, um, resulted in the biggest encirclement in world history, over half a million Soviet troops, um, about 750,000 were surrounded and cut off, um, and then and then two years later, the Battle of Stalingrad, where Hitler refused to allow General Paulus to retreat. 600,000 German soldiers surrounded and captured, considered by many to be the turning point of the war. And then a third example, one of the most famous retreats in history, and some consider to be the reason uh, critical in the communist defeat of the nationalists, was the Long March, which also elevated Mao Zedong to the... To the uh, to the top of the Chinese communist hierarchy, where he wasn't before that. Um, so this re and this retreat thing is a really important issue because I think often um, leaders, if they don't have confidence in the ideological commitment of their soldiers, they 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 confuse cowardice, or it's hard to determine the difference between cowardice in the face of the enemy and the military necessity to withdraw. Because, um, you know, of course, if you're not committed ideologically, you're not going to lay down your life for a cause that you have half-hearted belief in. But then on the other hand, um, defending a, a position which is indefensible is just a recipe for catastrophe. And it's been a long time since I've read The Art of War, but I think Sun Tzu talked about retreat um, as a very important part of the military process is to not face the enemy when the enemy is stronger, to, to melt away and attack when the enemy is weaker. So there's this kind of back and forth idea. Um, and so I, because Sun Tzu is um, presumably, I, I mean, I think he wrote around second or third century BC, so presumably he was well known at this period. So I'm, I, and so this, and then what you said about his father going over to the Manchus makes me wonder if coaching uh, um, had questions about the loyalty of his troops. And that might have been the reason why he was so adamant about not allowing retreats and could have possibly um, made him militarily less effective. Um, so I, I'm interested in your comment on that. Thank you. Yeah, Mark, I think you are quite right. Uh, Kosinga had qualms about the loyalty of his troops because many of... Uh, uh, Zheng Zhilong's troops have defected uh, with him to the Manchus, so he wasn't totally sure of his troops' loyalty. But he tried to instill in them the uh, the virtues of uh, loyalty uh, in these men. Uh, but as usual, when you put these men to uh, the battlefield, you know they could waver. So he had to put in all these uh, military invest investigators or invigilators to. Uh, behead them if they retreat, just like the, the Soviets did during the Second World War. Um, and also the KMD forces during the anti-Japanese war in China also did similar things, um, but not by beheading the soldiers, but by shooting them. Um, so there is an element of that, definitely. And uh, as to whether Zheng Chenggong read Sun Tzu, I can't say for sure, but uh, that's 
he probably, most probably did, uh, because that was well known at the time. But there was no records that I could find that attest to the fact that he had he had mastery in the art of war by reading Sun Tzu or had been uh, well versed in 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 Sun Tzu uh, Sun Tzu's uh, um, directives in the art of war. He was uh, more interested in studying uh, under the Confucian canons. So if uh, there are none, no other questions, I will proceed to the next uh, segment and hopefully I'll end it before, uh, way before four o'clock so we can have a more general uh, discussion. So I'll proceed to the question of why Kosinga. So the first one is uh, Kosinga is a Sino-Japanese person who totally embraced the Ming dynasty. So you know, in, in, a, in a way he became more Chinese than the Chinese. He was loyal to the Ming dynasty to his last breath which uh, is astounding. This is a, a, a very loyal servant and subject of the Ming dynasty. And he's by no ways, but, and he's not a pirate. You know, if, if somebody calls uh, Kosinga or Zheng Chenggong a pirate, that is a great misunderstanding because in the mind of Zheng Chenggong, Kosinga himself, he was always the loyal servant and subject of the Ming dynasty and not a pirate. He fits the great man theory of history. So history would have been very different without Kosinga. Firstly, Taiwan would not be Chinese. Then the Spanish would have conquered Mindanao and Catholicized the population there had they not have the, had the need to focus on uh, countering Kosinga's threat to Luzon. So um, Kosinga literally changed history. That's uh, the reason why he is important. He, was a great man. Without him, history would have been entirely different. The will to power, as Nietzsche would say, he was a man, Kosinga, powered by will and devotion. He was a man of destiny. He willed the Ming resistance into action when all seemed lost. Um, the Ming loyalist resistance to the Qing, the Manchus, decreased in intensity and ferocity after Kosinga's death in 1662. So Kosinga embodied and personified Ming loyalism. The Ming cause became him and he became the cause. So after him, there was no more great Ming loyalists to carry on the cause. His end was the end for the Ming dynasty. Really, I mean, his son and his grandson ostensibly carried on, but they were more, you know, paying lip service than doing the real thing. So he was the real, the, the true, the real McCoy. He is the great hero of the Hokkien people of China, the Hokkiens, a national hero of the Chinese because the Chinese have many national heroes. He's one of them. And uh, Zheng Chenggong is a local hero of some Japanese people, especially those in the Hirado region of Nagasaki. The Dutch obviously hated him and created propaganda against his cruelty. The Spaniards hated him as well, for obvious reasons, because uh, they nearly lost the Philippines because of him. The English have a rather interesting and nuanced view of him, generally, as they made, they, they, uh, made a brisk business selling arms to his son Zheng Jing, made a lot of money, so they were less antagonistic towards, towards Kosinga. So Zheng Chenggong is remembered fondly by the Hokkien's uh, as their warrior prince and representative who made them proud by resisting the Qing dynasty to the very end and when all the other Chinese peoples have capitulated and also by conquering Taiwan. He literally puts the Hokkien's on the map and served notice on the potential greatness of this group of Chinese people. His loyalty to the Ming continued to resonate amongst this group over the centuries, especially amongst the overseas Hokkien population. To this very day, overseas Hokkien people have the tradition of praying to the King Kong, the heavenly, heavenly Lord, on the ninth day of the Chinese New Year with uh, sugarcane plants, which they call the Bai King Kong, which, by the way, today in Asia, is the ninth day of the, uh, of the Chinese New Year. And the Hokkien people in Southeast Asia are praying to the heavenly Lord today. And this is 
done to commemorate the distant memories of the Hokkien ancestors who resisted the Manchus and who escaped death by hiding in sugarcane fields. This shows the latent hatred of the Manchus towards the Manchus among this group of Chinese people and why they are so proud of Zheng Cheng Gong. And by the way, when the, the when Dr. Sun Yat-sen operated in uh, Southeast Asia, this group of people was uh, one of his chief uh, sponsors because they were very interested in overthrowing the Manchus. That's the legacy that Zheng Cheng Gong left for the Hokkien's. So Zheng Cheng Gong was also a uh, is also a tragic hero in a very Greek and Chinese way. He died when his greatest accomplishment materialized. His life was like a comet, short but monumental. He was amongst the first Asians to defeat the Europeans militarily. His victory over the Dutch in February 1662 was not the first such victory, although it was the most consequential in the 17th century. The first such victory was the defeat of the Portuguese fleet by the Ming Navy in the Battle of Tunmen in 1521, uh, which is close to today's Hong Kong, where the Ming fleet under Admiral or Commander Wang Hong defeated, routed the, the, the Portuguese fleet under Diogo Calvo. So the Portuguese thought they could just overwhelm the Ming fleet like the, the way they overwhelmed the uh, the Malays in Malacca, the Mal Malacca Sultanate just took over and took, took the land. That was their initial strategy to just uh, conquer China. But in the first encounter, they were already blown to bits by the Ming Navy. So later on, they decided, well, you know, we, if we can't beat them, we have to join them. So by sort of uh, bribery, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, they gained a foothold in Macau and then they uh, uh, redress as the uh, loyal servants of the Ming, and they were allowed to stay on in Macau from 1555 until 1999. So it just shows you that the Portuguese were very good at uh, diplomacy in that way, when they can't uh, win by firepower. So the second such victory was the victory by the uh, Kosinga's father, Zheng Zhilong, in 1633 at the Battle of Liao Luo I, Liao Luo Bay in Jinmen uh, against the Dutch, where Zheng Zhilong, Nicholas Iquan Gaspard defeated the Dutch in a great naval battle. So there were a few other victories by the Manchus, the Qing against the Russians in the 17th century. But after that, one would have to wait until 1904 to 5 for Japan to inflict another stunning defeat on a European power, this time Russia. So the Chinese themselves had a few victories, minor ones against the French in the Sino-French Wars in the uh, 1870s. But uh, that was a century of humiliation for them. So for the Chinese to really stand up and be noticed, it happened in the uh, battle you know, in the Korean War in 1950, when deep in North Korea, thousands of soldiers from the People's Volunteer Army 39th Army and encircled and attacked the U.S. 8th Cavalry Regiment with three pronged assaults, assaults from the north, the northwest, and the, and the west, and overran the defensive position flanks in the Battle of Onsan, or what the Chinese call the Yunshan Zhanyi, which was a clear victory for the People's Volunteers. So subsequent stunning massive Chinese infantry assaults, encirclement, and annihilation attacks led the American and the United Nations forces to retreat south of the 38th parallel. And this happened almost 300 years after Kosinga's victory over the Dutch, when the Chinese finally uh, was victorious over the West. Um, Zheng Cheng Gong Kosinga is the reason why Taiwan is a part of China today. If it did not exist, the status of China would be, or of Taiwan would be in doubt. The Ming Dutch Treaty of February 1662, where the Dutch surrendered and ceded their territory of what, how they pronounced Taiwan at the time to China, to Ming China, is the defining historical document that attests to the fact that Taiwan becomes part of China on and after February the 1st, 1662. 
Before that, the Chinese, uh, you know, they like to claim that historically Taiwan has uh, been a part of China since ancient times. But really, there was no, they didn't govern the, the, the island. They didn't have any administrative control over the island until Kosinga conquered Taiwan from the Dutch. So really, China's hold over Taiwan happened after February 1st, 1662. That's the uh, basis of the uh, legal claim, that uh, legal uh, reality that Taiwan is a part of China. That's because of Zheng Chenggong. So Zheng Chenggong is also a very tragic character. He is betrayed by almost everything he believed in. His teacher, Qian Chenyi, defected to the Manchus. His father <laughs> defected to the Manchus. His emperors were killed. His mother was violated and committed suicide. His son committed incense, incest. Well, not really, but uh, Confucian statutory incest. He failed in his eyes in whatever he did except for the conquest of Taiwan, which was uh, really an afterthought by him. He, if he really wanted to march to Beijing and overthrow and push the Manchus out, but had he accomplished that, history would have changed. And the question about what if, so what if he did not die in 1662? So according to the historian Tonio Andrade, Kosinga was poised to attack Manila and would have defeated the Spaniards. In 1662, his forces raided several towns in the Philippines. And Cosinga's chief advisor was an Italian friar named Vittorio Riccio, whom he sent to Manila to demand tribute from the colonial government of the Spanish East Indies. And he threatened to expel the Spaniards like he expelled the Dutch if his demands were not met. The Spanish refused to pay the tribute and reinforced the garrisons around Manila. But if Zheng Chenggong did not die in 1662, he may have conquered Manila and perhaps Luzon on behalf of the Ming dynasty. And then possibly Manila and or Luzon would have become a part of China as well because he was doing this for Ming China, not for himself. So history changed because he died in 1662. Kosinga's threat to invade the uh, islands ex and expel the Spanish was an inf important factor in the Spanish failure to conquer the Muslim Moro people in Mindanao. The threat of the Chinese invasion forced the Spanish to withdraw their forces to Manila. They immediately evacuated their fort on Zamboanga in Mindanao following Kosinga's threats. They left some troops in Jolo and Lake, uh, by Lake Lanao to engage the Moro in protracted conflict. And then they per permanently abandoned their colony in the Moluccas when we drew the soldiers from there to Manila. So they changed, you know, the, today there is the, the Muslim insurgency in the Philippines because the Moros were allowed to fight on because uh, Kosinga intervened in time to uh, distract the Spaniards from, from finishing the Moros off. So here is a painting depicting Pastor Antonius Hambrook leaving his daughters in Fort Zealandia. This painting hangs on the walls of Anping Fort in Tainan today. Well, this uh, pastor went, was sent by Kosinga to persuade the Dutch in Fort Zealandia to surrender immediately. Instead, he went there and told the Dutch to fight to the bitter end and not surrender. So when he returned to uh, Kosinga, Kosinga had him executed because he was uh, supposed to uh, go and uh, convince the Dutch to surrender and not to convince them to fight to the very end. But I would say that he did that all in vain. He might as well have convinced the Dutch to surrender because the Dutch surrendered anyway. So he died in vain. So, so that's uh, too bad, tragic. So here is a plaque in the Dutch village of uh, Chipluiden dedicated to Pastor uh, Hambrook. You can see 1606 to 1661. Here is the uh, uh, writings in Old Dutch. And then here, these are the writings in the uh, Aboriginal uh, language of the Siraya, Siraya language here. And here is a map showing the Muslim Moro area saved by Kosinga's intended invasion of Manila in 1662. So, you know, Zamboiga, for example, Jolo and Bindanao today, this part is still Muslim because of the timely intervention or non-intervention by Kosinga. The Spaniards had to face Kosinga. 
So here is an altar by the Hokkien's for the purpose of praying to the Lord of Heaven, Fai Ti Gong, on the ninth day of the Chinese New Year, which is today in East Asia. So you can see that there, there's, a, there's a sugar cane plant here and here that the Hokkien's uh, used to pray to the heavenly God because they were saved, their ancestors were saved from the Manchus by uh, the sugarcane plant. Here is a copy of the Ming Dutch Treaty of February 1662. So now here, uh, maybe I will just uh, soldier on instead of doing this. Now, now the legacy of Zheng Chenggong, there are many names in Taiwan um, where which bears his name, places like Zuo Ying, Xin Ying, Lin Feng Ying, Jian Tan, Guan Tian, Guo Xing Xiang in uh, Puli, Taiwan. And then there are roads and places with names like Yan Ping Road, uh, etc. in Taiwan. And in uh, Xiamen, there is this road called the Si Ming, si Ming Lu, uh, and also Yan Wu Ting, all these remnants of uh, Zheng Cheng Gong's uh, legacy in these places. It's arguable. I would I would argue that uh, Zheng Chenggong, because of his unfulfilled ambition, started Taiwan on its sentiment of sadness, Beijing. You know, the Taiwanese have a people have a sense of frustration, of of sadness, of uh, of unfulfilled ambition, uh, partly because of the history uh, bestowed upon the island by Zheng Chenggong by his unfulfilled. Uh, a quest for, to reclaim the Ming Dynasty from the Manchus. It also means uh, the catastrophe for China's coastal provinces because the Qing possibly moved coastal populations inwards by the Great Clearance, the Qianjieling in 1662, where they emptied the coast of 15 kilometers between the sea and island, creating a no man's land. So it's devastating for, for the uh, peoples along the coast. Um, Zheng Chenggong also means, in, you know, other than being a hero, it also means catastrophe for the over, overseas Chinese communities. As ethnic cleansing was pursued by the Spaniards uh, in Manila in 1662, killing 22,000 out of 25,000 Chinese, mostly Hokkien Chinese, in Manila. And then the Dutch, because they remember Kosinga and how the Chinese were unreliable, started a series of pogroms against the uh, Chinese in uh, Indonesia, in Dutch East Indies. For example, in 1740, there was the Batavia massacre, whereby uh, uh, at least 10,000 ethnic Chinese, again, mostly Hokkien's, were died, were, were massacred by the Dutch soldiers. So this is a image of the Prince of Yanping Shrine in Tainan, and that's the entrance. And you can see that the KMT uh, government added the emblem on top of this Japanese looking uh, gate, which is not very aesthetically uh, intelligent because you know no matter how much you want to add to it, it's, it's still a Japanese looking gate. It won't become Chinese. So the KMT failed in uh, their art design campaign. So conclusion, I would like to say that uh, this is the assessment by the young marshal, Zhang Xueliang. I translated it badly again, and I'll read it. He who was an unfilial son, a lonely subordinate and a young Confucian scholar, with a heart filled with righteousness, he resisted the powerful Manchu invaders. Nevertheless, his greatness lies not in upholding the Ming ruling houses, but in ensuring that Taiwan joins the domain ever after. So in Chinese, it goes like this. And to that, I end the lecture, but here is a painting depicting the Dutch surrender to Zheng Chenggong in February 1662, an oil painting. Another painting in watercolor showing the same event. And here is the uh, entrance to the Zheng clan ancestral home in Tainan. And uh, it's fitting to end with the uh, statue of uh, Miss Tagawa and, and uh, Zheng Chenggong because the story of the love and devo devotion between a mother of son and son is very important. Miss Tagawa raised a great son for the Chinese people. So finally, 
questions and comments. Feel free to ask anything you want. Thank you. So Mark, please. Thank, uh, thank you, CK. Uh, great presentation. And then that's, uh, I think we have uh, five minutes le left. So that's <laughs> extend for another. Well, thank you. You have uh, over 100 pages of presentation. And then yes. been, I hope it's not too rushed. And then uh, we will. I will put in the recording, and then the presentation. I will post it, uh, in the uh, meetup page. So, uh, I probably need another two weeks to study if you want to know all the detail. But anyway, mm -hmm. thank you very much, CK, and let's share some opinion and how do you see it, and then let's have some brief discussion. Uh, thank you. So we'll start from where. Mark and the Kwong, right? So, go ahead. Yeah, thanks a lot, CK. Um, so you mentioned um, earlier the Black Guard had um, a standard with the Virgin Mary on it. Um, I'm wondering, um, and, and you said that the Black Guard was composed of Africans and Southern Indians. I'm wondering if you know where the Christian influence came from and, and, and like how that played a role in the Black Guard. That's, I have another question, but that's it for now. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, the Christian influence came from the Portuguese. The Portuguese were operational in Goa and in view in India. And uh, wherever they went, they uh, Catholicized the local populations. Like in Goa, they uh, converted a number of uh, low caste Hindus quite a number of them into, into Catholics. And these Catholics, um, well, black Dravidian peoples, later became part of the black guard. Similarly for the Africans, the, the Kafres, the uh, black Africans, they were uh, Catholicized and they were moved around from uh, places like uh, Mozambique, uh, Angola to uh, India, to Goa and then to Malacca and then you know to Macau where uh, where uh, Kosinga's father Cheng Zhilong uh, recruited them himself. He, he recruited three hundred of them and later on uh, uh, enlarged it to five hundred and enlarged the black guards to five hundred men. Yeah. Thanks. And my second question is: How do modern um, Taiwanese independence supporters feel about the legacy of Cheng Tonggong? I am not qualified to answer that question because I don't know and much about uh, how the Taiwanese independence people look at Zheng Cheng Gong. If they want, I, I my guess if, is if they want to be to be uh, objective, it's very difficult to call Zheng Cheng Gong an independence supporter because he had never supported Taiwanese independence. He always claimed Taiwan as part of China. And he was doing it for Ming China. So, you know, it's very difficult to uh, add Kosinga to your uh, uh, lexicon if uh, if historically Kosinga was a Ming loyalist. That would be my guess. Yeah. So, um, Jason, please. Yeah, I'd like to just exactly answer Mark's question <laughs> about Taiwan independence. Uh, thank you, CK, for the great presentation or the fact. Okay, I have no doubt about fact. But in my opinion, it's just probably just opposite of what CK talked about. Because I see uh, Zheng Chenggong or Go Xinya represent a resistance to the uh, Chinese annexation. And then it represents a Maritime country is never together with the continental country because Zheng Chenggong represent a maritime, maritime force from Japan, Taiwan, and his father as a pirate and the international deal with the uh, Portuguese, Dutch, they all maritime uh, state or maritime power which never together with the uh, continental power, which is China. That's why China and Taiwan never together. That's my view. And then to me, Zheng Chenggong is a great guy. 
and because he's not loyalty, because he's strong, resistant of great power. That's my argument. And then another thing is about why at the beginning CK talked about he is not being called Zhu Cheng Gong, which is the royal, uh, the, uh, royal surname. I think the reason is <clears throat> uh, in the uh, Qin Dynasty, he, Qin viewed him as a resistant force, but Qin, Qin Dynasty want to praise his loyalty to the loyalty heart because that's important. So in a way, Qin government want people respect his loyalty, but not his loyal to Ming Dynasty. That's why, you know, call him Zhu, not the one to call him Zhu Cheng Gong, want to call him Zheng Cheng Gong to separate. I think that's the reason, you know. So I stop here and we have more questions on that. Uh, next one is Quan, please. Okay, um, I want to add my small grain of song to the question of uh, Taiwan and China. Uh, let's not forget that under the Ming, chi China, the Ming Empire was not only a tellurocracy, meaning a land power, but also a talassocracy, meaning a sea power. So that is a deep mis misunderstanding from most people and especially among the Westerners. China is not only a land power, China is also a sea power, especially during the Ming Dynasty. And what is happening now with the return of the Chinese Navy is simply the restoration of the normal state of China, meaning both a land power and a thalassocracy, which is the fancy word for a sea power. I would just want to take 30 minutes, but because I don't want to monopolize the time, when you mentioned CK that the battle in Korea in 1950 would be the, the end of the century of humiliation, I beg to differ a little bit because maybe you forgot the incident called the Amethyst incident on the Yangtze River in during spring 1949, when the Navy of the People's Liberation Army uh, arrested the British vessel called the HMS Amethyst and managed to neutralize the HMS London, the HMS uh, Consort, and the HMS uh, uh, the last, uh, Black Swan to rescue the HMS Amethyst, allowing the Communist Party of China to ask to the Great Britain, France, the United States to leave completely their military presence from China. Okay, so I would say that April 30, 1949 was the moment that the century of humiliation of China ended. And the amethyst has been uh, retained in Nanjing for 10 weeks uh, till July 30, 1949. I stop here. And thanks again for your outstanding presentation. Oh, thank you, Quan. I agree. Yes, you're technically correct. But in terms of massive military uh, operations, 1950 would be the one that uh, brings to that springs to mind. Yes, the amethyst, but that was really a small fry operation comparatively. So, so uh, yeah, technically you are correct. Yeah. So, Mark, please. Absolutely. Uh. Oh, I'm sorry. I just forgot to take my hand down. I don't have another. Oh, okay. Thank you. Okay. Sure. May I take 10 seconds? Yeah, certainly. Yeah, certainly. I, I, I would say that you're absolutely right, but I would I want to finish with adding an expression. Okay. Uh, the, the incident of the amethyst ended what the infamous gunboat diplomacy. Yes. Uh, Jason, please. Oh, yeah. Uh, another thing I'd like to, I disagree on one thing about the, you call the Beijing, uh, the feeling of sadness. Okay. Uh, I think that that's not, uh, my understanding, you know, based on growing up in Taiwan, my understanding is the Japanese influence, okay, because of the so called Awade, okay. So uh, that's a Japanese aesthetic. And I will claim 
that's more influence Japan much more than uh Zheng Chengong and then uh we or I should not say we at least the people around me we see Zheng Chengong more <laughs> Japanese than Chinese and more resistant than uh loyalty because that's the view the Taiwan meet uh well at least the people uh around me okay believe and then that's the view you know but i have no doubt about the fact that you talk about and that's a great information but just hold a different view and i just want to say everything we all have a different view and uh, that's the life you know yeah, yeah. certainly uh, uh, i want to add that uh, the hokkien's chinese were a maritime power in and of themselves wherever the Dutch, the Spaniards, and the Portuguese went in the 15th, 16th, and 17th centuries. Everywhere they went, they already found the Hokkien's there. So the Hokkien's were there before them. They were, they, they, you know, they, had, they can't operate without the Hokkien's. So the Hokkien's had already monopolized the Southeast Asian trade before the Dutch arrival, before the Portuguese arrival, and certainly before the Spanish arrival. So the uh, China was not a um, continental power only. China was also a maritime power, very much so. So what Jason said before that, uh, you know, Taiwan and uh, mainland China, they are two different because one is maritime power, one is a continental power. The dichotomy is not that sharp because, uh, you know, the Hokkien's and also the Cantonese and also the Hakka's, they were adventurers, they were uh, maritime uh, pioneers, they were sailors, they traveled the seven seas, especially the Hokkien people. So yeah. there wasn't uh, this sharp dichotomy and China had this uh, long tradition since the, uh, at least since the Song Dynasty or even earlier, yeah, I would say the Tang Dynasty, because I mean, Quanzhou was uh, recorded under the travels of Marco Polo as Zaitong. Mm -hmm as the most prosperous and you know the, the biggest port in the world. And that was a port, Quanzhou was the preeminent port. And they were powered by the Hokkien's, the Persians and the Arabs in Quanzhou. So, you know, China had a, a, a long and glorious maritime tradition. Yeah. yeah, and let's not forget the other admiral, also called Cheng, having started Chinese maritime expedition at the beginning of the 15th century. Right. Yes. So two generations before the discovery of Christopher Columbus. Yes. Uh, and I would say that in history, there are three things that we have to take into account. The facts, as you presented very brilliantly today, and what I call mythology. OK, everyone has a right to his own views with this mythology. But mythology, when compared to facts, often will not resist when facts are presented. And there is a third point which is called truth and truth is precisely that human endeavor and that human faculty to make the distinction between mythology and fact. Yes. I would say that Kosinga, uh, Zheng Zhenggong throughout his life valued the title, the Da Ming Zhao Tao Da Jiangjun. He used this title the most. He loved it. You know, it's the title that he adored. Yeah, is uh, Dai Beng Jiu That is the title he used to accept the surrender of the Dutch in the name of the Ming Dynasty. So the Dutch surrendered legally to China based on based on that. So okay, DJ, please. So, uh, oh, uh, DRJ, yeah. Yeah, just a quick one. Um, so this sort of depends what you what you think China is, right? Doesn't it? A bit. Um, let me start a war here or anything. But um, you're saying that uh, he, uh, our hero here was uh, anti the Manchu, mm -hmm. pro, pro China. Mm -hmm. So that was Manchu doesn't count as the Manchuria, it's not China. What are they, South mm -hmm. Russians? What do you no, want? They, they, they were also China. The, the, the legitimacy. He's anti China and pro China at the same time, then, right? Uh, no, he wasn't anti China, he was anti Manchu. Right, so the Manchu was uh, was uh, representing another contestant to the uh, 
to the um, sovereignty of China, the sovereignty and the legitimacy of who China was at the time was contested between several claimants. Like yeah. the Manchu was one of them, the Southern Ming emperors were a few of them, and uh, even Li Zicheng was contesting the uh, the mandate of heaven. It was called the mandate of heaven. So sure. even even as the uh, you know yes you're right which China so so uh, Kosinga was representing Ming China. He considered Ming China the legitimate government of China, whereas the Manchus would consider their government the Qing dynasty. Uh, version of China. But nevertheless, even after 1683, when the, when the Manchus finally conquered Taiwan, that whole question was put to rest because then, you know, they inherited uh, the Kosinga's uh, conquest of China by conquering China, uh, of Taiwan by conquering Taiwan themselves. So that is uh, legally Taiwan became a part of China from the international law perspective. Thank you. Welcome. So, Steve, please. So, you're using history, going back to history, to find times when China took over an area and then it becomes part of China. Mm -hmm. Do you admit to examples of in history where places become no longer a part of a place, generally, through other historical events? Uh, sorry, what was the question again? You're reaching back to mm -hmm. history to find examples of when something, when Taiwan became part of China, your, your mm -hmm. argument that it legally became part of China because of this historical event. Are there mm -hmm. not also historical events that would cause, it, it, everything you've described is an accumulation to China. Are there not examples where things split off from China or other countries? Yes, I would give you the example of Vietnam. Vietnam was a part of China until, uh, you know, from probably from uh, 200, uh, 200 BC, uh, when there was a, there were tribes living there to around 900 AD. I, uh, Vietnam was, uh, well, not Vietnam, it was called uh, by various names at the time was part of the Chinese empire. But by the year 900 AD, ex around that time, uh, it became independent. And although the Ming dynasty had a short uh, rule of about 20 years, it continued to be independent after that. So Vietnam was uh, an example whereby it was no longer part of China. And how does that example differ from the more recent Taiwanese history? Uh, well, it differs because Vietnam is now an independent country and Taiwan is not. Uh, CK, may I interrupt? Yes, can answer, I suppose. Thank you. Yeah. May I ask yeah. something, CK? Sure, sure. Yeah. Uh, in the case of Ta in the case of Vietnam, there was no Potsdam Declaration in 1945 stating that Vietnam is part of China. Let's not forget that our world order now is a world order coming from the victory of the US, of Russia, of Great Britain, of France, and of China. So those five countries have a preeminence in the dictation of the international order, and they are the five permanent members of the Security Council of the United Nations Organization, which is the supreme statutory organization for the home planet. In 1945, after the Potsdam Conference, there was an official declaration that Taiwan is part of continental China. And that is the official stand of the international community. It's not a, a question that is in debate. Now, that is correct, Juan. Thank you for uh, stating that. Actually, Article 8 of the Potsdam Declaration references the uh, Cairo Declaration of 1943. And in the Cairo Declaration of 1943, it declares that all the territories stolen by Japan from China uh, are to be reinstated to China, including Manchuria, including Penghu or Pescadores, including Taiwan and its surrounding islands. 
So the legal position of Taiwan is in no doubt. It is a part of China. After the Potsdam Declaration, which Japan accepted unconditionally in 1945. So next is Dave, please. I, I think that's a focus on the uh the topic. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, just a little more about the present day. I would say a little bit the other effect about Taiwan is after Mao's revolution, it was that about 1947, 49, something like that, that the former government we call the Nationalist Chinese fled to Taiwan and took up residence in Taiwan and, you know, of course, resisted the uh, Chinese government, uh, the communist Chinese government. I think if that had not happened, I didn't think, I don't think we would recognize this huge distinction between Taiwan and China. To me, to me a lot part of it is the, the nation's Chinese, which is kind of funny because I'm sure they've all died out by now, but we still respect that difference. And, uh, and of course, the thing is, uh, Taiwan is state immigrant independent and democratic and done, has done a lot of uh, innovation and things like that. So it's it's a very interesting area. Thank you. Yeah, welcome. Uh, who's next? Uh, so I think Jason is has uh, something to say, right? Yeah, I'd like to say uh, to me, uh, Zheng Chenggong is uh, kind of represent the Taiwanese, right? Basics is partially Japan, uh, partially Chinese, partially uh, international, because I believe he, I heard he speak Portuguese or Dutch, yeah. and, and the, of course he flew in the Japanese and the, the great in uh, Chinese. So I do, I do see him as a great example of an international mixed person and have the strong will to resist all the power. Okay, so that's it. And then we probably need to close in a few uh, things. And CK, you have last thing to say, then we probably we shall close. Well, yes, if, uh, I'm just waiting to see if there's any more questions. But I think in his mind, um, Ko Singao, Zheng Zhenggong has no doubt that, uh, yes, he, 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 he was very aware of his Japanese birth. He was uh, born in Hirado, and he never uh, shied away from that. But in his mind, he was the servant, loyal servant and subject of the Ming dynasty. So he was Chinese to the core in that sense. Um, and he was uh, grounded in the Confucian classics. So he considered himself Chinese. And the Hokkien people have never considered him anything else other than <laughs> as Hokkien and as Chinese. So if you go to the Fujian, uh, Southern Fujian today and, you know, ask about Zheng Chenggong, I believe that very few people would actually think of him as Japanese. Most of them would consider them uh, Zheng Chenggong as part of the Hokkien people, no question. He was their warrior prince, full stop. So, you know, the fact that he's Japanese is, yeah, it's true and it's a footnote and uh, Zheng Chenggong didn't shy away from that. But it is not... Uh, of great significance to the Hokkien people. They embraced him as fully Hokkien and fully Chinese. Okay, so, we open it over time, uh, 20 minutes, I think. Okay, so so you want to take Mark as the last comment or you want oh, to? Oh, sure. Okay, so yeah, uh, Thanks, Jason. So I don't really have a dog in this fight as far as whether mm -hmm. Taiwan is or isn't a part of China. Um, but it was interesting to hear, to me, um, especially from people with Chinese heritage, different viewpoints about history and about the interpretation of uh, Zheng Chenggong's um, uh, place in history and how that relates to the 50s. So I know um, for a lot of uh, Chinese people in particular, it's a pretty emotive issue and it has a lot of deep uh, cultural and political significance. So I just wanted to say I really appreciated uh, hearing the different viewpoints and um, perspectives on it. That's it, thanks. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah. All right, uh, thank you CK for the great presentation and uh, let's leave the difference of opinion on the table. Okay, sure. so we can continue discuss, have a civilized discussion, okay? So that would be great. And the next week uh, we will go to 
Uh, okay, next week I'm going to present the uh, continue present the, the short history of the Chinese philosophy uh, from Feng Yulan, uh, the background of the uh, Chinese uh, uh, philosophy. Okay, so uh, Jason, uh, Jason, I want to say it has been more civilized. Our discussion has been more civilized. I very, want to say. Very so. I agree. Oh yeah, we all. That's why I I host this meetup so we can have a civilized discussion with all different kinds of opinion, opinion. You know, so uh, welcome. And again, I want to announce everyone uh, have a different opinion, and uh, you know, I'm very different opinion with CK, and a lot of time with Huang. Okay, and probably more different <laughs> than Huang. Not only in the uh, political issue. Uh, also in the Confucius, we have a different, totally different understanding of Confucius. But uh, I think we become good friends, you know, because our difference and probably same as CK. So anyway, thank you very much. And uh, then right. thank continue you. to discuss. And uh, again, it's an open platform. And as long as you keep uh, rational, civilized, and any opinion uh, is welcome. You know, and, uh, I have my own strong opinion. And if you feel your opinion is different than me, uh, you are welcome to present and you will come to challenge during my presentation. And same as everyone. Thank you, everyone. And see you Thank next Thank you week. very much. Very interesting discussion. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you bye very bye. much for uh, being bye. here. Thank you. Yeah. And one Thank thing I'd like remind everyone is uh, I learned a great lesson from the Meetup group. You have no way to convince people in one or two meetup. Okay, so just express your opinion and express your express your disagreement, and you are not going to convince anybody. But you know, you just express yourself, and probably ten years later, people may change it, may agree with you. But let's see. So, all right. Uh, so, as, uh, I would like to end this by quoting uh, Karl Marx. Karl Marx said. Philosophers have merely interpreted the world in various ways. The point, however, is to change it. There we yeah. go. Yeah. Okay. All right. See you guys. Ciao. Bye. See you. Bye. 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 Nice weekend. Bye.